Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode six of the Spoken Wheel Show. Yes, we are finally back. Has taken six months, hence why it's episode six. No, we did not do that intentionally. It's all We've just co- been really busy. Mm-hmm. All coincidence, all coincidence. So busy we can talk over each other. Yep, yep, yep. Now we are back, and we will have a little bit of a new format. Our pieces will be a little bit shorter, makes less editing time, takes less filming time, allows us to produce more content, so we don't have another seven-month break. Yep. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show if you enjoy it, and if you don't, I'm sorry. Let's get into this in three, two, one. So the first car we're going to be talking about is the new Rolls-Royce Boattail. Now I know what you may be thinking, this is not really, uh, not many people can buy this car because there's only three in the world. Yes, three in the world. And they're going to be selling at a very, very, very expensive price. Not many people can afford $28 million. The most expensive car for sale right on now. On the new car market. Except yeah. you can't buy it, so it really isn't yeah. the most expensive car and for I think, sale. And I heard one person already bought one. So like I said, there's going to be three going to be made. Very rare car. You won't be seeing them on the road where you live. And uh, it actually has a very nice exterior. Um, and it, it has the influence of what used to be the 20s, early 30s Botel cars, which were actually Rolls Royces and, and coach builders that would actually take boats and then use that as part of the bodywork on, you know, uh, cars back then. Rolls Royces did it a lot. And that's why Rolls Royces are big. Mm-hmm. No, I actually don't want to know why they're big. No, they're just they're big. just big. Now, you might say, why would you get a Rolls Royce boat tail? I could just have a Phantom convertible. Yeah. Well, the thing about this car, it's the rear end. It doesn't yes. have a boat tail, which is very confusing. And what it's supposed to be, hence the name boat tail. Now, one of the cool parts about the rear end of this car is it has these doors over the trunk or the boot that open up. Like a butterfly. It's like, yeah. well, it's like a... It's like a little butterfly. Yeah. And actually, Rolls-Royce have provided on their website, if you swipe down, this very nice animation of the doors. This is also covered in a wood that you would see on a boat, the typical wood with the chrome stripes. I don't know what it's called. Not a boat person, as you can tell. The rear deck of the car has a cocktail set, a refrigerator, and even an umbrella for unpredictable conditions. And because this car costs $28 million and there's only going to be three made, you'll probably never see this car again or even hear of it again. Yeah. Just like the previous Rolls Royce boat tail they did. That was actually a boat tail, but they didn't call it the boat tail. And now it's time to eat a pastry next to the lamppost on the corner of Discussion Drive. (laughs) This episode on Discussion Drive, we are featuring the all new, made for fun, Ferrari 296 GTB. Now, the 296 GTB is the third Ferrari hybrid they've ever made. You had the La Ferrari, the SF90 Stradale, and now this. I guess third time's the charm, although the other two were really good. So, eh. Now, Ferrari's big thing, this car is about having fun. I mean, any Ferrari is for fun, really, when you think about it. The big deal with this car is the fact that it has a three liter twin turbocharged V6. Most Ferraris either have a V8 or a V12. Now, this isn't the first time Ferrari's done a six cylinder, but it has been a very long time. But the good part, so you listen to this little video Ferrari provides, actually sounds really good. And it almost sounds like an eight cylinder. <laughs> This car being a hybrid, of course, it's gonna accelerate well. Zero to 60 happens in just 2.9 seconds. Now, this car can be ordered with the Assetto Fiorano package, which basically improves the suspension, increases the aerodynamics, and the weight can be reduced by a whopping 26 pounds. Now, 26 pounds is a bit of a joke when you think about it because you can remove a seat, remove carpeting, remove a suitcase. Yeah. It's a bit gimmicky because when they do upgrades to these track versions, usually it's a couple hundred pounds. But 26? That's it's a bit of a not, joke. That's not much. So in the end, if you were to purchase this car, and if you really were to go and do that and you're watching this show, it's going to probably cost about $320,000. So not exactly uh, the cheapest Ferrari on the market. And this is supposed to be the entry-level one. And what's a bit confusing is the F8 Tributo costs a little over 300000 And so this costs the same. So how could the entry-level cost more than the uh, one above it. The regular one. So yeah. it's a bit confusing. They're, Ferrari's competing against themselves. Yeah. Which I don't really understand. Moving on to cars that have just been released, we have the Lotus Amira. Car is estimated to be priced at $75,000, and the car can be ordered with either a two liter four cylinder engine or a three and a half liter V6 that makes 360 horsepower. 
Being Lotus, of course, the car is going to be lightweight. It's all going to be about the driving experience, which I think we need to have a lot more companies like Lotus out there where the cars are more focused on being fun to drive where, instead of being fast. So basically, this car uses a carbon fiber and bonded aluminum type frame and body, uh, which the suspension, engine, uh, drivetrain, etc., etc., are attached to. Now, this car is the first affordable Lotus in the Geely era. You might remember Geely actually owns Lotus right now, and while the first Lotus under the Geely era is the Avija, or Avija, Evija, however that car is pronounced, this is the first affordable one because the Avija is the top of the line Lotus that will cost quite a bit. This is the Lotus you're actually gonna be seeing on the road, and I like it quite a lot. Now, one weird fact I did notice about this is the engine is actually off-center. It's a bit so crooked. Rotate the image for you, you'll notice uh, it's not it's exactly in the middle. Why Lotus did that, not quite sure. Uh, just a weird little gimmick. Maybe to balance the weight of the driver, which is at the front left of the car, and then put the engine. But you do have a passenger seat. Well, well, mainly, you got to drive. Uh, okay, that's true. Well, think you're, you're racing, racing you, you, race, you, race, you race with the passenger. Start raising your hands because it's now time for the bidding paddle. We have some Fantuzzi news on the bidding paddle. Right now for sale at the Goodings & Company Pebble Beach Auction is a Fantuzzi coach-built 1957 Maserati 200 SI. Now, this car is absolutely gorgeous. It's beautiful. Now, this one did get raced in the 1950s and 60s as well, so it's got some heritage to it, which is really cool because a lot of cars like this often just end up in some guy's collection in the middle of nowhere in a garage deep down in Montana, where you'll never see it. Yeah. The car is a 2,490cc DOHC inline four-cylinder engine <laughs> with twin Weber 45DC03 carburetors. Joey. This is a very 1950s style Italian sports car, racer, whatever you want to call it. It's a great car to buy if you have the money and a big garage in Montana. It's estimated to sell to four, four and a half million. It might go over that. You know how Mount Monterey is. Cars can go below or more than what they're estimated for. And we've seen that. A lot. That's just how the world works. Well, Monterey is part of the world, so well, he is well, right on that. Hence, moving on. <laughs> So on to our upcoming cars, we have an Aston Martin Valhalla. Now, this car is priced around about $800,000. Now, that's not exactly cheap for an Aston Martin. And yet, this is supposed to be what we think is going to be the entry-level supercar, but... We don't know. We don't know. That, that, that's pretty darn expensive. For If I wanted to go and buy it, which I'm not going to go to because I like Cadillacs, but if you imagine you were going to trade in your Porsche, you get about 500 bucks, and the, your mom would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Now, like all Aston Martins, it is equipped with a AMG 4-liter twin-turbo V8, which you can find in just about any car these days. Yeah, because Simply AMG... Simply call up your friends at Mercedes AMG, and they'll have it right ready for you. Literally half the showroom at Mercedes-Benz is AMG engines just engines and pretty much all last no actually apart from the valkyrie which no one can buy yeah. every single aston martin can come with an amg four liter twin turbocharged v8 which is a dry sump motor with a hot v's twin turbo setup so this aston is designed around a carbon fiber tub sort of like how the lotus was earlier in the episode but this is basically the same thing engine suspension all the other components frame carbon fiber tub now, this is not Aston Martin's first mid-engine car. They probably had a few test mules back in the day, and of course the Valkyrie's mid-engine as well. But this is supposed to be, speed-wise we estimate, at the entry-level supercar market. So we're talking the Ferrari F8 Tributo, Lamborghini Oricon, Porsche 911 Turbo S. However, because it costs $800,000, I'm thinking this is more aimed at the Ferrari SF90 Stradale, which costs also $800,000. <laughs> But of course, with Aston Martin and Ferrari, the prices they tell you are not usually the price it is. Right now, we're pulling those muffins out of the oven, and we're walking right in to Roast My Ride. Roast My Ride this episode is the gorgeous, or not, depending on self-interpretation, Mazda MX-30. All right, let's, let's take a first look here. If you look at the picture that my dear friend Joey has selected for us and the viewers to see, Zoom in on the man who's driving the car, or test driving, or who's whoever doing the driving He's in this He's rather car. concerned about something happening on the road next to him. Of course, there's nothing on the road next to him because it's a forest. He's more, he's more concerned so. that he's driving a hideous car. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. the front grille is disproportionately small. I mean, that's awful. They had to put the bumper in, and the bumper size is good. Bumper's nice. But then Bumper's they nice. had to put this massive black bit because mm -hmm. there's so much of the car remaining. And look how big those wheel arches are. It's just like two massive, huge wheel arches. And why in black plastic? I know. And car companies, if you're listening, stop using black plastic. In three days. No one likes it. In three days, four days, I'll, I'll, I'll say in one week, they all get faded and they all turn bright silver and no one likes it. It's like budget chrome and then- Yeah, budget chrome. But it's not chrome. Yeah. So let's take a look at the headlights. The headlights look like someone accidentally broke off a piece. And if a car was to have missing teeth like a person was, this is what you'd get. It's a bit like a beaver. It's like- So like it's non-compatible BMW i3 that no one wants anyways, it has a flappy rear door, which- No, it's, it's not a rear door, it's a flap flappy rear thing that goes behind the front door that opens the other way like a suicide door on a 1966 Lincoln Continental. Except you can't open it without opening the front door. Which isn't like a 1966 Lincoln Continental because a 1966 Lincoln Continental can open either way. So and that's it's a good why, car. Yes, and that's why you should buy a 1966 Lincoln Continental instead of this Mazda MX-30. Uh, now if you've been watching our show for a while, you'll know on Roast My Ride, very common of bad looking cars to have the rear end chopped off. And this one, of course, like a good loaf of bread, it's been chopped off. So back in the 20s, a lot of cars had the opera window for actual cars that were designed for going to an opera. Then in the 70s, they sort of brought it back because it kind of looked cool. Now, Mazda kind of brought it back, but it doesn't really look like a rear window. So no, it's, it's not really it's too functional. Big, it's and not... it's so big that it looks like the rear window is too small. Yeah, that's it, it, just, it's kinda, it looks like it continues the rear window in another window. Yeah. That's not good. Which is not good. And look at the massive B pillar. I know. That's who huge. Needs a, who needs a B pillar that big? Well, maybe safety. But who cares? If you bought this car, we're not concerned. You might say, why are we complaining about the rear window? It's not something you look at often. Well, every good looking car has a good looking rear window, as we will now demonstrate. When you look at the rear window of this 59 Cadillac, it's good looking. When you look at the rear window of the 60 Cadillac, come on, it's good looking. Speaking of good looking cars, if you want to see more of Derek's collection of classic cars, Check out this video for an in-depth comparison of his three 1959 Cadillacs. Now, we'll go back to the regular show. The interior actually looks very nice for this kind of price range car, but it's got two massive huge screens, which is worse than a Tesla because a Tesla has one. So, this is even worse. And it's worse because the two screens are blocked, so you can't actually see them. The one on the top is blocked by the dashboard as it sinks in, except being a Mazda probably doesn't fold in like an Audi screen, which looks yeah. really cool. And the one over and every here Audi is, driver has to show it off. Yeah, and this one's blocked by like the gearbox or the gear lever stick thing. And the real disappointment about this interior is the fact that after seeing the exterior, you're literally shell shocked, and you won't be able to enjoy the interior because of the vision loss you have suffered. Yep. All right, there you go. We are finally back. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you haven't yet. Please subscribe to the channel for more content to come. As always, I'm Joey. And I'm Derek. And thank you very much for watching. And we'll see you next time on The Spoken Wheel Show. Goodbye. <laughs> this is where we leave. And the episode oh, yeah, ends. We leave.